Hey guys, welcome back to season two of The Soccer Sofa, hosted by myself, The Stud. And me, The Horse. As we started season two, we wanted to start with someone a little bit special. A defensive midfielder who's so good at his job, they call him the Invisible Wall. With a staggering 94 international caps for Brazil, making him the eighth highest ever cap player in their history, as well as 450 career games, amassing 12 titles, including the Copa Libertadores, two Confed Cups, the Greek Cup, the Greek League, two FA Cups, the Premier League, Copa America, and most importantly, the World Cup. This man is able to class Roberto Carlos, Ronaldo, the original one, not the Portuguese one, Patrick Vieira and Thierry Henry as close mates. Ladies and gentlemen, roll VT! A partir daqui, muita coisa mudou, tomou um novo rumo. Então, por isso que tem o um nome de fenômeno. E foi uma alegria total. Welcome back to season two, episode one. Ladies and gentlemen, Gilberto Silva. How are you doing, Gilberto? So oh, good, Peter. How are you? Thanks very much for having me in the show. It's an absolute privilege to, to have you on, especially when you're over in Brazil, giving us your time. So thank you very, very much for joining us on the soccer sofa. It's great, great. How are you, buddy? Very good, thank you, Gilberto. If I could start with your life right back at the, the beginning, um, and what was life like for you growing up? What were you like as a youngster? Well, um, I grew up in a, in a very small village uh, near where I'm, I'm actually um, at the moment. I'm in my hometown now, but uh, called Lago da Prata in Brazil. But uh, the village I grew up is about five kilometers from here, where my, my parents used to work in a sugarcane factory. And until 12 years old, I grew up there, you know, in this little village, playing football on the streets and going to school, play football with the kids in school, my lots of um, cousins and uh, friends. And uh, yeah, this basically is, was uh, how I grew up, you know, uh, free to play on the street without uh, think about uh, the, the problems of life, you know, like drugs, for example. We didn't have any, any circumstance that we had to worry about. That's why we were there, play on the street, not give much trouble at home, but um, create between ourselves, you know, the kids, an environment uh, very safe for us to play and enjoy life. The life was, let's say, we were poor kids, but uh, we will never stop of being happy and being creative of uh, create what we want to play. Either football, create a, football, a ball with uh, plastic, so whatever we could find on the street. If we could not afford to buy uh, the, equip the right equip equipment for us to play. And, and do you think this uh, upbringing and, and this style of football is what made you into the player that you were um quite a defensive strong resilient um do you think that was where the foundation started uh, of course when i look back um one main aspect for me is about my family i think this is the best foundation i could ever had have in my life you know and they are the strengths of everything the the base of everything where everything starts for me not only football but especially in life because uh, things you learn at home sometimes when as a kid you don't really understand what your parents say you know? sometimes oh my dad oh, again again my mom you know but uh, as long you grow up we understand how important is uh, what they 
they tell us when we, we grow up. And um, I think this foundation at home was really important and understanding my background uh, very clear was easy for me to understand what I want for my future. And when I get to the, into football, I knew exactly where I came from. I always remember this very close because you have to look to the mirror all the time and uh, see where you came from. Uh, the steps you've made and you know, the condition we had, we, we didn't have a you know, good condition. We, we never miss, for example, we always have food at home, but the, the situation was not the best. But, but uh, as a family, we were together, you know, uh, facing all the circumstances and the difficult times we, we, we had in life. Uh, I understand this from as a young kid, you know, and um, growing up, uh, and coming to football, for me, is about to give you everything to make things happen. Because um, one thing was sure for me, uh, when I, I have seen my, my dad work in the, in the sugarcane factory, the first time he took me uh, to see it on the last day, because this is agriculture uh, circumstance, I said to myself, I was about seven years old, I told him, I don't want to do this job. This is too hard. But I, he didn't have option to raise us in the best way he could. And, and then, of course, oh, well, actually, my first question is, were your family supportive of football? Did they believe that you would go as far as you, you went? My, my dad, he used to play amateur football, you know, and that was like enough to play together with him in a, in one amateur club he played here, was well, really good because um, he always been very concerned of uh, me get any injury and always told me, oh, don't give the ball, don't give the ball, give one, two touch, three touch, maximum, don't run in the ball. And when I get into a professional game, you know, it's uh, like an academy uh, club. Of course, he always been supportive to me. But um, coming from this village, it seems like, you know, Belo Horizonte, where I, I went on the time, it was not too far, only uh, 200 miles uh, from here. It was not too far, but for us, you know, the condition we grew up, it seems like moving to Europe some, somehow. <laughs> and, um, but uh, they always uh, supported me. And, but uh, the most important thing, he wants me to be happy, do what I... I want to do. If I was there, if I was happy playing football, they were okay if I had to come back because in the process I was there for a, a short time and came back to my hometown. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> after, you know, um, because let, let me tell you a story a little bit. <coughs> I came to my first academy club when I was 16. <coughs> And stayed there only five months. And after five months, I didn't want to stay there because I was missing family. The situation was not so easy, very different from what I was used to. And um, all this, this new environment, you know, uh, was very strange for me. And then I came back and worked for two and a half years in a switch factory in my hometown and kept playing amateur football. That's where... I, I, on this time, me and my dad played together. I was 16 <laughs> on this time. It was great. But um, therefore, after you know, two years, I started to, to change my mind because when I came back to my hometown to work, I came to work to help my family and uh, decided to, to return to football. I was already 19 years old. Was a, I knew it was the last shot in football, last chance. And I did everything I could, you know, to prepare myself without any, any proper training, anyone to advise me what I had to do, a fitness coach, whatever. But I, I knew one thing, I want to be part of it. And I did everything, you know, in the deepest part of my heart to stay there. And this is how things develop. And, and of course, your first club um, or first pro 
club or, or academy was uh, America Minero. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Um, and you were quite late getting into the game, really, at sort of 18, 19 years old, as, as you say. Um, but just yeah. to put things into perspective, and this might be incorrect, so please tell me if I'm wrong, the, the job that you took was paying you £50 a month. So I imagine the academy wasn't really paying you particularly well. It wasn't like the academies we see today where these players can be on hundreds of thousands of pounds a year at 18 or 19. was very little. <laughs> this is reality. Yes. Uh, one thing is that because um, you know, it was uh, not the biggest club in the country, America is the third club in Minas Gerais. And, um, but... Um, I think was a, like a perfect place to start because uh, when you start things in life, I guess that is important to face difficult situations to learn the basic principles uh, of this. Uh, for me, the, 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 basic, uh, the basic things of football. And uh, when things become, because you always aspire to, to improve ourselves. Because if you, if you arrive uh, straight away at the top, what you aspire for, what you look for, you know, to, oh, oh, this was um, very important to start uh, at America Mineiro. As a small club, you have to work hard because, um, as you said, you know, the money in the academy, I could not even come to visit my, my parents to pay a, a bus tickets. But I was happy by the time, you know, and uh, until the problems arise and then uh, I had to change my mind and came back to work. But um, one important aspect because uh, America, they always uh, focus in the academy players. This is their DNA, they have to produce players because they are not financially uh, wealthy compared to the other clubs. They have to work with their resource and the, the, the academy players. This I guess was really important as well. Uh, and of course, you did have a lot of success there when, when you went back after working in the factory. And I think you got promoted in your first season from Serie A B to Serie A. Um, and then, of course, you, you left and went to their local rivals, Atletico. Um, how did that go down with the uh, loyal supporters who I imagine absolutely loved you? Oh, they were... Regarding the supporters, they were fine. They understood it well. Because um, first, uh, they knew that America could not, uh, let's say, stop me to go. They, they, they could not keep me. Uh, it's a process they, in the moments, they have to sell somebody to make uh, some money for the next year. Then uh, I was the player of the moment for them to, to do it. And um, things works well. I think uh, America wants to sell, <laughs> Atletico wants to buy, and I wants to to have a, a a new challenge in my career. And Atletico was very challenged at the beginning, but uh, it was a fantastic experience, you know. And then you have at the beginning to balance yourself to adapt to a new environment very quickly. Uh, and this was at the age of twenty four, and we starting to realize. I could really make a, a good career out of this, or was it still uh, you weren't quite sure how far you were going to go? When I, um, I, I have this pretty clear in my mind. Um, from the moment I left the factory here in my hometown and came back to America in the last year of the football, the, the academy. I knew the, the, the first thing for me was about to be part of the team, be part of this process, this environment. Because if I was there, I knew I could not lose to myself. I have to win, you know, uh, against, uh, win all the challenges I would face. I didn't know how hard they would be, but um, I have something in my mind and my heart. Nobody will take this away from me. This is my, my, uh, my time, this is my opportunity, and I'll do everything. And therefore, I, I worked really hard. I had, apart from the, the work we, we did um, with the team, I always worked 
extra times, you know, after the training session, in the afternoons, and uh, concentrate exactly what I what I need to do in order to to be successful, to achieve the results I want. But then when you move from a me- and then things start to go pretty fast for me because then I went to the professional team. A few years later, I went to Atlético Mineiro, another step forward and on different dimension. And with Atlético Mineiro, the team did very good, very well. And um, I got my opportunity to, to be in the national team. You know, they, it's like uh, a big promotion. <laughs> I may say that. Oh. Uh, okay, um, you've changed position on my screen, uh, Gilberto, but we'll, we'll carry on. Um, so then you, you teamed up with uh, Carlos Alberto, uh, who's a bit of a legend of, of the game. Um, was he a big influence in, in you at that still early on in your career? Of course uh, he was, um, because um, when you work with somebody um, like him, you know, he knew the game, he had won the World Cup, uh, you know, everyone respect him a lot. And you ha- one thing you must have in mind is to learn with this person and uh, pay attention to what he said to you. And uh, at Atletico Mineiro, we, we worked very shortly, but then we have an opportunity to work again uh, for um, uh, 2006 World Cup in Germany, where he was the manager. And while we, we had a proper time to work and for me to learn from him, uh, listen to his advice, to his, uh, you know, the way he worked in the past with great players like Pele, for example. And it was great to, to listen to all these this stories from him, Z- Zagallo, and the other guys from, from the staff, you know, older than me. They have like, uh, a very, um, very important background in football, you know, they were winners. I want to learn from them. They, of course, those people, they, they inspire you because you want to reach that level. And um, the importance of work with them because they push you and uh, you want to get there, you know. Or, then I start to ask, ask questions to myself, how does this person get there? and pay attention and start to do things that uh, maybe some other people were not really to do. Just work, work, and work, and keep the focus on what I want to achieve. And you transitioned, if I'm not mistaken, from a defender and under Carlos Alberto went into the defensive midfield that everybody around the world now now knows Gilberto for. How was that transformation? It was was very interesting. Um, I, you know, my original position has always been uh, a central midfield. Uh, but uh, when I I went to America Mineiro, you know, uh, when I arrived there after work in the factory, I, as I, I said to you, the important thing for me was not about playing my position because the guys in the position I, I played, they just uh, have, have become uh, a, a champion of uh, Copa São Paulo from, of the Football Academy under 20. And uh, I see, oh, there's no place for me there. This guy, they are champion. <laughs> I need to be part of the environment. And then I start to play as a center back. If they give me a gloves, I would be a goalkeeper. <laughs> And it's this, it's this attitude that obviously has made your career because the willingness and the tenacity and the hard work. And then it, it wasn't unnoticed because in October 2001, you were called up by Big Phil Scalari to the Brazil squad. And I just want to go through some of these names because for, for me as a football fan, let me go, Cafu, Lucio, Emerson, Zé Roberto, Rivaldo, Denilson. The, these are things that for me and Paddy were on our bedroom walls, the, what players these were, and you're now joining these at the age of 25. And what was that like to get your first sort of game? Am I correct in saying it was Bolivia at the La Paz Stadium? Yeah, 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 it was Bolivia, uh, in Bolivia. Yeah, oh, this was great. Now I'm, I answer a little bit 
what part, what you asked before in terms of the transition, you know, and then things start, you know, I, I moved back again to my original position later on at Atlético Mineiro. I played a few times at America, but in Atlético Mineiro, I, you know, start, I, I dropped back and then had this transition to central midfield. Was when um, we had, um, we were doing very well in uh, Brazilian Championship and got called by Scolari. It was like, you know, it's a, for me, it was like a God's gift. And uh, because you realize how fast things have, have gone for me when I, 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 get, I got back into football, leaving the factory and arriving there at America, moved to Atletico, and then in a short time, I was in the national team, being selected to the last two games of, uh, uh, of the qualification for 2002 World Cup. And uh, of course, when you are there, you know, among those those guys, is for me it was a little bit scary. You know, the, I was used to watch Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Roberto Carlos, Cafu, Ronaldinho on TV. You know, cheering for them, and then I was there between those guys. You know, I, I was like in, in the heaven, but um, really to uh, to observe them, to learn with from them but but those guys they were very important for me because um, they knew how uh, how it works to be in the national team depression they helped me a lot of course the, the first game was not so well <laughs> against Bolivia away we lost uh, the game always been very hard to play there in altitude but then we qualified in the last game against Venezuela and um Obviously, that means qualification to the World Cup, which everybody knows the outcome of that World Cup and what a World Cup it was. And there's a bit of fortune here, because am I correct in saying that even though you were in the squad, if Emerson was fit, you may not have played much of that tournament? Yeah, this was the reality at the beginning. I was uh, going to start the competition on the bench. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the good things about um, that group, everyone enjoyed being there. Everyone was very happy, despite who else was like they start in 11. But unluckily, um, Emerson got injured in the, the last uh, day of our preparation, was the last training session. Um, and um, then uh, Scolari came to me later on and say that Emerson was not going to play, he would have to return to Brazil because he was not able to, uh, to play the competition. And he was choosing, he chose me to start the next day. I said, oh. I took a breath and say, okay, uh, I'm ready. I'm ready, that's why I'm here. But they were, you know, very nice to me, him and uh, his assistant, uh, Murtosa and said, listen, we, we want you to do what you are doing at Atlético Mineiro. If you can manage that, we are going to be happy. I guess it works, <laughs> because I played those seven minutes. And, uh, and um, therefore, you know, was almost a decade in the national team was, uh, was amazing, amazing journey. And it, it was around this time, am I correct in saying that you got your famous nickname, the Invisible Wall? Yeah. How, how did this come about? Was this just teammates? Was it the fans? Was it the press? Oh, this is a very interesting story. Yeah. I didn't know somebody was <laughs> uh, nicknamed me by the Invisible Wall. I, I would never imagine that. The good thing is that um, after we, we won against won the game against Germany. A famous journalist here in Brazil, Pedro Bial, he wrote, uh, you know, uh, a very uh, a beautiful message uh, of every player of the national team about the way they, they played and how they performed, something like that. And uh, he said to me that I was like the invisible wall. Nobody would see me, but I was there. You know, taking care of the problems 
of the team. Because, you know, when you have uh, Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho, all these big stars, Roberto Carlos, Cafu, nobody pay attention about the, the other players. <laughs> this is normal. But um, the, the important thing for me is about accepting this, you know. You have to work hard for these guys to, to perform in their best. And uh, then after the, 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 we, we won the game. And Pedro Bial said this to me, and then it, this became quite natural. And then I moved to England, and people started calling this invisible wall, invisible wall. Well, I, I really enjoy it because basically it's, the, it's how I always uh, did on the field. You know, nobody would see exactly what I'm doing, but I was there when the team needs me uh, to clean out, you know, the, the problems. Try to at least... It's beautiful because you mentioned there Ronaldo and Rivaldo. I remember reading, uh, uh, I think it was Vecha magazine, who said that Gilberto carried the piano for Ronaldo and Rivaldo to play their tunes on. What a lovely compliment that is. Yeah, no, I really enjoy this because um, the, I, I believe the easiest thing for anyone who join this uh, these guys to play among them because you want to be started like them at some point but it's quite impossible they are on a different level and the important thing uh, is for me and for other players uh, on a different level to understand that those guys they make the they make you win the games and you have to do everything for them flourish in the game, to perform well, give them the best support. And we understood that. I was not the main, scar, main guy to score goals. I, I knew exactly what I had to do. I had to work hard to get the ball back and give Ronaldo, give Rivaldo, uh, Ronaldinho. If they lose again, don't worry, I'll be there. I'll run again to get the ball back as much as I need to do. As long as you understand that, your job become easy, you know? But you have to understand the principle. You have to understand exactly the, the, the players you got in the squad and understand the job you have to do. Otherwise, you want... I could not become Ronaldo. I could not become Ronaldinho or, or either Rivaldo. I have to be the best Gilberto Silva as possible to make those guys comfortable and do whatever they can to make us win the game. And the other hand, at the back, we have to do everything to stop the opponent to score goals. This is what we did, you know, me, Cleberson, Rocky Junior, Edmilson, uh, Lucio, Roberto Carlos and Cafu, you know, uh, and Marcos at the back as a, go as a goalkeeper. I think I understand that things become easy, but it's important to know how to catch the piano. This is the point. How much of that inspiration was taken from, arguably, you're, you're one of Brazil's best ever defensive midfielders. But was, am I correct in saying one of your idols was Dunga? And how much inspiration did you take from him? Of course, he was one of my inspiration because he was the captain of 1994. And um, he faced uh, tough times before this... Uh, uh, this achievement in the, in the national team suffering a lot of oppression. Um, when uh, in back in '98 and even before the the, the, the press uh, call his generation like uh, the, the failures, this is not fair. And uh, then he overcome all this uh, this trouble and became a World Cup winner and the captain of the team. Of course. As a player of my position, I try to, um, on my way, to learn from what he what he did to achieve that the way he played and um, you know understand the position. Because if you you don't need to be too clever sometimes, it's just about to be humble to learn and accept that you don't know everything and work to improve your game. As long as you are humble and you understand that, you open your heart to learn. And you learn from everyone. Learn from your idols. 
from your coach and from players you played against. And uh, the good thing, what really improved my game, I guess, was the player I was playing together and the player players I played against. Because they were top players. They always push you to the limit. And you have to be sharp. You have to work very, very hard to try to, you know, to stop them or to play with them. And But, uh, you did? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. But Dunga was one. Uh, Toninho Cerezo, he played for Atlético Mineiro. He was one of my idols growing up, you know, as an Atlético Mineiro supporter. And Zico, you know, different from my position. I like very much uh, Baresi from Milan. You know, he's another player. I really love to see, to watch him play when I was a kid. Absolutely. Unbelievable names there. And you did, you did play all seven games in that tournament. And obviously, I, I'm British. I've, I've got to talk about the quarterfinal, England 2-1. Um, so just to remind people of the game, so Michael Owen, I think, was a Lucio mistake at the back, 1-0. Yep. Um, and then a future teammate of yours, David Seaman, uh, was caught with the Ronaldinho free kick. Did you remind Seaman of that when you joined Arsenal? No, he was too big. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I was too big, very serious. But I never asked him. You know, I always had a, a real respect for him. Uh, we still, you know, after we retired, I uh, still never speak to him about the situation because I know for him it was too hard afterwards, you know, to face the criticism. Because everyone blame many people blame him for, for for this goal, but the fact is, you know, when somebody asked me if Ronaldinho pretend to do this free kick and you know, direct to goal, for me it's still I, I don't know. Uh, it's still very difficult to say if he try or not because you can expect everything from these guys. They were genius in the in the way they play football. You could not understand exactly what was on their minds because they could change immediately. They improvise every time. They could see things others would not see. And uh, that when we talk about this this goal, you know, and understand that Ronaldinho took the free kick, you can you can say that everything is possible. He he meant that, or he changed immediately, you know, his mind when he got to the ball. Everything is possible, but only him <laughs> is the, the person capable to, to say the, the, the real truth. And I even watched uh, the, the goals again in preparation for this. And even Rivaldo's goal, Ronaldinho ran 30 or 40 yards stepping over the ball. It's just, he was, was he really that good? He, he just looks unbelievable. Yeah, he was, uh, he was amazing. It was amazing. You know, it was. Look, uh, for me, uh, I always tell to myself that I was really fortunate to play among those guys, because you know, having Ronaldinho, or all, all them, all of them, because all of them were, were big stars, and I've learned so much uh, from them. And this particular situation, when he got the ball, he starts from the back when I think Rocky Jr. and Roberto Carlos got the ball from Dave Beckham. They slide on the floor, he jumped. And I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm not wrong. I got the ball and passed to Ronaldinho. And uh, he starts with the ball and the run and the step over and passed to Rivaldo and uh, he, he scored an amazing goal. You know, he put, what really intrigues me is where he puts the ball because Dave Sima, he, was massive, you know, on goal. When he opened his arm, you know, you barely see space to put the ball. And he put the ball where I don't... Far corner. Exactly. I, not many players can do this. But, uh, you know, he was, was great. But all the, you know, from the moment we got the ball back uh, and the Ronaldinho run, you know, I think uh, uh, the conclusion of it, you know, was amazing. You know, by the the whole process. 
And I, I have to obviously talk about Ronaldo. For me, we see Messi, we see Cristiano Ronaldo. But for me, the best striker that I've seen, Ronaldo, what a player. I agree. Not because he's Brazilian, but... Um, uh, by the way that he played, you know, by the way he played uh, football, he, he's like a street boy playing football. You know, it's mainly our style in Brazil. Many of our players grew up like this, playing football on the street and uh, having the freedom to be creative on the field. Of course, you know, when you are in a football club, you have to have your structure uh, understand this. But what I see nowadays is that so many coaches are taking the creativity away from the, their players you know, when they are young. Then they grow up scaring of tries, traveling, scaring of making mistakes and uh, not, uh, let's say, um, use enough their, their talent. But um, this is uh, how Ronaldo plays, you know. You see Ronaldo is one. We, have, we can see now, nowadays Neymar, Robinho, um, Ronaldinho. This type of players that uh, our country produce that uh, make the difference in, in the game. And uh, Ronaldo for me is, uh, is the best. Oh, you know, best strike I have. I have seen. I have opportunity to to uh, to play together. He certainly was unbelievable, and he finished that tournament with eight goals. Rivaldo got five. You were the highest goal scorers, I think, eighteen goals. And Marcos four clean sheets, thanks to your defensive work, the work of the defenders. But the biggest award I have to talk about for the the Brazil, as well as winning the World Cup. What happens with Ronaldo's haircut? Beautiful. <laughs> uh, well, we, was he we, that good? He could. Was he that? Was he just that good? He could do whatever he wanted. Nobody commented. Nobody would say anything. You know, if he did some other strange things, you know, it was quite weird, honestly. <laughs> but nobody would tell him. You know, of course, we make some fun of him behind the scenes. <laughs> but uh, I guess it's because um, I think that I don't know if it was in the same final against Turkey. He left the field and uh, he was feeling something he's growing. And uh, in the last few sessions, he was still feeling something. But he didn't want to tell Scolari because he didn't want to miss the final. And um, I think in the other hand, he didn't want people to know that he was facing any problem on his muscle. Because uh, I think I believe in the back of his mind came out the, the problem of 1998 in the final against France. And he didn't want to have the same, the same ghost in his mind. And um, therefore, when he did that marvelous record, <laughs> Nobody would, uh, would talk about uh, the final back four years ago in France. Nobody would, take, would pay notice about if he was feeling his groin, he was not sharp enough. Everyone put attention on his nice haircut, <laughs> if I can say that. Clever. I think he was very smart. He was very smart. He's a smart, smart person, smart guy. And then he did it on purpose to avoid you know, put the, away uh, all the attention from the journalists to ask him questions about 98, if he would have the same problem, if he was sharp enough to play the final. It works. You, you obviously went and you won the final 2-0. And I, I asked you to bring this. May you show people your, your World Cup winner's medal. This is incredible. Well, I managed to, to bring them to the show. This, uh, let's see, can you see it properly? Yeah, it's just incredible. We officially have a World Cup winner on the soccer sofa. Really, yeah. Um, it's, it's quite simply, simply incredible. Um, it's quite old, you know. It's, <laughs> it's quite a long time. It's almost almost twenty years, but um, well, the medal still looks really nice. Wow. 
Sometimes I, for, I, for, I forget about this. <laughs> Gilberto, the, the next chapter of your, your life started and um, it was a phone call from Arsene Wenger. How, how did that move come about? Well, after the World Cup, I, I, I never played again for Atletico Mineiro. I was so to Arsenal and uh, it was great. I was very happy for, for this opportunity. I remember on that time came out in the press that um, some other clubs want to, uh, to, to take me from Atletico Mineiro. And, um, but then um, I went to Arsenal. It was like, um, for me, a perfect choice um, to play among those, those guys uh, under Arsene Wenger. And it uh, was great, you know, it was, was unbelievable. I, honestly, I don't know how I think it was like uh, negotiating between the clubs. For me, I on that time after the World Cup, what I really want to is um, to have an opportunity to play in Europe. And um, but then understand this situation came out in the press that a club in Turkey, like I think it was Fenerbahce, and other, I think Werder Bremen came out as well. But I don't know if it was true or not. I didn't negotiate on that time. And then, you know, um, understand that Arsenal was there. I, I think the club as well had an agreement and uh, was great for me, this, um, this decision to, to move to, to Arsenal. I think it was a perfect move. Of course, when you move to a club, despite the players who's there and uh, you try to get, you know, some information, I didn't know exactly what, how it looks like until you get there. And, um, but everything works perfectly. Having Edu in the club was really helpful. You know, he was like my, my big brother looking after me. Am I correct in saying that the first person you met when you went to Arsenal though was Ray Parler? Correct. <laughs> how, how, Correct. Was it meeting, how was it meeting the Romford Pele? Because you didn't speak English at this time. And I still think Ray Parler doesn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was nice, you know, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. I, I didn't speak English at all at that time. I remember I flew to, to Austria with uh, Dave Dean and Dick Law at that time. He was you know, involved uh, with Arsenal. And um, in the lobby of the hotel in Austria, in the camp, and the first player just came down was Ray Paolo. They introduced me uh, to him. He was, you know, very nice. I didn't understand everything. And after six years uh, and oh, many years of seeing him afterwards, I still don't really understand very much sometimes. <laughs> I'm joking, of But uh, Ray Paolo was really nice. You know, he's a very nice guy, very nice person. You know, he was very nice to me this day. You know, despite the fact we could not understand each other. But uh, later on, you know, as long as I start to learn the language, you know, I managed to have a few conversations with him, try to improve my English. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> No, he's a lovely person. I, I really love Ray. He's a lovely guy. And, and then your, your first game was uh, the Community Shield against Liverpool. And I think I'm right in saying you scored in front of 68,000. How, how was that? Getting, yeah, how was that? Um, starting, starting your career at Arsenal and getting, getting off the mark in that first game? It's amazing. More than what I expect, to be sure. Because... Um, um, I really want to, to do well for us, you know. I really want to, to, to do the best I could um, to, to bring back, you know, the, the, the trust they have of bringing me to the club. Because uh, when you, somebody signs you, you know, to play for them, the first thing I had in my mind that I need to give something back to this club because they trust me. They did all the effort to, to bring me to to this club, I need to, to do my best for them. But uh, starting like this was, was more than what I expect, to be honest. 
And uh, I came off the bench and to score the winning goal was something amazing. And the, the interesting thing, I don't know if, if, if you find out on my podcast, we spoke this a few episodes ago. I didn't know exactly the importance of that game when I went to the game. It was like a Super Cup in, in England. I didn't know that. I just knew that we, after the, the preseason, we had this game to play against Liverpool. Like uh, happened here in Brazil, after the preseason, normally the clubs, they, they, they play like uh, friendly games before the competition starts. In my mind, it was something similar. <laughs> and uh, we went to this beautiful stadium, Millennium um, Stadium, Wales. I was out you know, to see all these grounds around, uh, you know, all red on the both teams. And um, when I scored the goal and after the game, uh, I see the trophy come. I asked Edu, what's, what's happened here? Yeah, we became champion, we became champion, we became champion. I said, champion of Bonacia, Liverpool. Who was the second cup? Oh, well, let's celebrate. Let's have a party. <laughs> and I start to enjoy. I start to understand the importance of this game. But it uh, was, was amazing, you know, as I, I told you. And it uh, was more than what I expect. But um, very important, by the way, I start. Because I guess when the club signed me, a World Cup winner, there is a lot of expectation from, from people. And uh, what they expect from you is to do the best you can to, f- to fulfill their expectation. There was certainly a lot of competition in midfield at the time. Um, Edu, Petit, Vieira, uh, yourself, I'm sure. Oh, Parla. Um, uh, but eventually your, your first start came at West Brom, I think it was, a 5-2 win. Um, how, how was that experience getting in the first team and establishing yourself? I remember the first few games um, at Arsenal was really hard, really hard for me. I got smashed by everyone in the middle of the park. You know? I was not really, uh, I, I did not know exactly the pace of the game in, in English football and play at Highbury or some other uh, stages in England, you know, quite narrow and not uh, too big as some others. It was quite tough for me to um, to um, get into the game and uh, get into the, that pace. It was like uh, being uh, hit by a truck many times of the game. You know? Many times of the game, I, I left the game many times destroyed. Took me a few days to recover for the next game. But uh, after, I think, four to five games, it became much better. I coped with the, the idea of uh, the fast game. Many times, many of the teams play direct game, you know, long balls. And um, the good thing is because also, you know, the, we had a, a very technical team. The team was very good on technique. And the quality of the players made a huge difference on my game. Helped me a lot. And also with Arsene, because um, I was used to play in Brazil, you know, as a central midfield, uh, keep the possession as many clubs does nowadays. But uh, play around, you know, move to one, one side to another. Until a day he came to me and said, I want you to play straight forward <laughs> when I get the ball. Look up front, you know, just pass forward. I got the idea, understood, and uh, make this uh, part of my game as well. But for me, it was always about making simple in, in the game. Make things simple for me, my position, be in the right place when I don't have the ball. But when I had the ball, make things simple and make the other guys in front of me play. And you say there about how difficult the Premier League was and getting clattered. I think you used the term hit by a truck. Who were the toughest midfielders to play against? Uh, We had uh, very good battles when we had to play against Manchester United. They were right in both schools. 
But uh, for me, you know, Paul Scholes was one of the hardest players to play against. Not because he was like the, the hard tackling, because he was very smart, was very intelligent player. He knew exactly where to be, uh, how to, to use his, his brain in the game. He re reads the game very well. And um, if you leave him space in front of the goal, he could hurt you, you know, score from long range. And um, for me, he was one of the toughest opponents I faced in, in the Premier League. Because of this, you know, all these attributes he, he got made, made him a, a very special player. And, and then this 2002 season, um, you could really start to see the momentum of the side uh, building. I don't think you lost an away game all season. Um, and were you starting to realise that actually this side uh, had the makings of, of being one of the best the Premier League has ever seen? Uh, my, in my first season, or two or three, uh, we know was 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 quite as we expect. It was a little bit frustrating because we we lost uh, the Premier League to Manchester United. You know, the season before before I arrived, Arsenal won the double. We had the same opportunity, but um, I remember after the the a game against Blackburn away when we drew. 2-2 after leading the game 2-0. We never played the same football. You know, I don't know, for some reason, things became, you know, it seems like came out of your hands. You know, we, we had a good advantage uh, in terms of points and we miss a great opportunity. But uh, I believe this situation, this frustration, uh, led us to become what we became, you know, a very strong team. Uh, because we could not um, try find the, the right answer. But the right answer was um, we have to give to ourselves on a daily basis, train very hard. Because if you see the way we train after, after this, you know, even before, but afterwards, after this frustration, was like a fight, a fighting every time the training goes. Sometimes, many times when we train against each other, was much harder than play some of the games we played during the 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 season 03 or 04 because we we want to we were not happy with what happened with us season before and um but Arsen you know they made a marking point at the beginning of the season that the team could go all the season beaten we could not really understand what, what he said and why, especially. Why he have said that, you know? <laughs> I don't know. He's sure. But I believe he was really sure about the players he got in hand, got in the team, the characters of everyone. And uh, what we just had in mind is to play football and win the game. We didn't focus about, oh, let's go all the season beating. We just... Uh, made things uh, natural and uh, we just want to win the games and play football with trophies. And, and of course, you did um, go that season un unbeaten 2003-2004 um, and you were called the Invincibles. Um, you played 32 out of 38 of those games, so obviously quite an uh, important figure in that side. Um, who really stood out for you in training and, and in the team? Who were the people that were really pulling the standards up all the time? Well, I, in the training session, I think one important aspect for us is to have Arsene in front of everything, managing everything with his fantastic brain, of managing everyone. Everyone is egos, basically. Because, um, you know, when you are in, this, in a football club, everyone wants to play, but not everyone can play all the time. And, but he was, um, he was a master of uh, managing everyone to avoid the guys who were not playing regularly uh, feel important for, for the team. And uh, they were very important, despite the fact how many games they played. 
and um, ASEAN was really important. He was like a driving force pushing everyone in every session to improve. If we do a silly mistake, he always asks, hey, come on, let's make better, let's do it again. But uh, I think he, his job was not so difficult when you look up to that, those players because we do it to ourselves. And uh, if we see somebody who was not working properly, because sometimes you are not 100%. You know, someday you wake up, you're not too good. It's normal to everyone. And uh, arriving the training ground, not doing it properly, somebody, hey, come on, shake you. <laughs> and then you, you know, you come back uh, to, to, to the point where you have to be. In, uh, to do the right training, the right things. Because uh, in the game, you don't have a chance to make silly mistakes. This is uh, how we, we embrace each other, support each other, and um, fight against everyone together. Yeah, and there's one game that when you say about the fight you had on the side, a game that really sticks out was... Um that game we drew nil-nil against Man United um, and it was a Van Nistelrooy penalty that was missed at the death uh, that would have ended your unbeaten run. Um, and we saw actually the, the fight in person uh, on the screen. Uh, how was being involved in that and what was it like in the dressing room afterwards? Afterwards, it's funny. We we'll start laughing on ourselves. <laughs> about the situation but um, obviously um, the circumstances when we have like a situation like this where players want to fight on the field it's not it's not nice it's not good uh, for football it's not good for the fans and um, but sometimes this situation happened in the course of the game and uh, we believe that uh, Patrick being sent off in the situation with New Roy was uh, unfair and when he missed the penalty, I just remember Martin Keon jump on him <laughs> where everything, everything began. And <laughs> uh, the Messi around. And uh, I was trying to be the peaceful guy, and, but sometimes it did not work. And, uh, um, but in the end, you know, uh, we didn't have a major problem. And, um, but we, of course, we, we end up uh, when we arrived in the dressing room, happy with the result, the resilience we've got, you know, to to keep the 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 results, and of course we got we can say maybe it was luck uh, of him missing the penalty, but uh, this is the magic of football. This is the magic of the game. This uh, happened to us in the way it had to. And uh, because we work for it as well, as long as you work hard for things, I, I believe the, the universe conspired in your favor. It's like uh, everything works perfect for us. And uh, the funniest thing during the week <laughs> was some pictures that came out. <laughs> I was wearing like, they put me, put like a, a Indian coca, and some other guys with a uh, motorbike helmet <laughs> <laughs> during the week. We, we had fun on it on train ground. But, but most importantly, you kept your unbeaten run um, and you went on to win the league. But quite notably, you got knocked out of all the cups. Um, would it be fair to say all your attention was on the Premier League and actually the cup games it was hard to keep that consistency up? Well, we, we try to, you know, to, to keep the focus in everything, honestly. Because um, we knew the, for example, Champions League, how important it is uh, if Arsenal have had a chance to play the final, to win the final. And um, FA Cup, you know, we don't understand being uh, in the Premier League, how important it is, you know, to play the, this competition. But uh, it's a, a totally different game. The strategies are different. If you have one mistake, you don't have a chance to recover. But uh, in the league, if you, let's say, lose one game, you, you can recover because you have some other games. Unless if you are in the last two games, 
then it's hard. But uh, it's a different strategy, different competition. And then we um, we got caught by the opponents, the quality of the opponents we, we face. And in the end of the day, you have to accept that. And you have to sugar your frustration and uh, move forward because the next day you have to be on the field again, next few days. And um, the other opponents wants to take advantage of your bad time. And uh, you have to absorb things very fast to clean your mind and be ready for, for the next game. And I just have to say again, because I asked you to bring this if you, if you had it, Am I also correct in saying that you and Arsenal also have the only gold Premier League trophy because you were the Invincibles? And that was the same with your medals, I believe. So I asked you to bring your medal along to show. Yeah, um, I brought as well. Oh, this is so special. You know, this, this, these medals are so special. This one. Let's see how this. Wow. This, yeah. Let's see. Writing. There's only 25 of those medals ever produced, I believe. Ah, uh, this is uh, this is amazing, you know. And uh, the details of uh, of the medal is something very special. You know, for me, um, the great the great thing about football in all these achievements I have made in my career is looking back how things start in my life. Go back to the village where I grew up, play football on the street, and um, I understand that uh, all the values I, I've learned was so important when I reached this moment to keep things simple, to keep things uh, very well balanced, keep the feet on the floor, and uh, but uh, look forward for the next challenge, because um, when you achieve things in life, when you achieve special as a sports person, um, I may say, you have a, a huge responsibility on your life, on your career, you know, to give an example for the next generations, and um, but to to keep doing well, this is what people expect you to, to keep doing well. Oh, he won the Premier League. What's the next? We want him to win the, uh, the Champions League. Ah, he won the Champions League and now we want him to win the World Cup. You know, this is how people uh, have uh, the expectations about your game when you reach a certain level. And, uh, but it's important for us as a sports person, keep the, the feet on the ground and uh, to, uh, keep giving a good example for the societies, for the kids, and enjoy, enjoy these achievements because you have to, because it's very hard to achieve that, to get there. And when you achieve, just, you know, uh, take a breath and enjoy this moment because this moment is yours. You have to embrace it with all your power. And I mean, 2003, 2004, what was obviously a great season for you, but then your next challenge was was an injury in 2004, the 2004 season. Um, how, how did you cope with that? It sounded quite a serious injury at the time. It was very hard, you know. It's always hard for, for a football player to deal with injury. But um, I had not many injuries before I joined Arsenal, but uh, in Atletico Madrid I had some injuries. And uh, when this tough time for, uh, for a player come, came to me, I always try to put my mind away from football, concentrate first in reco my recovery and try to learn some other things, work out on my mind, you know, to read, especially on reading. Reading for me was really important in these tough times to learn, to, ha to balance myself and to understand this part of the process, but uh, um, to avoid you think negative, negative things uh, that can, you know, uh, put you down. Because it's so easy when you are injured 
and you start to, to watch the game, you become frustrated, you become depressed. And um, for me, it was, well, I cannot play football. Let's stop football now, concentrate my my recovery and uh, open up my mind to learn uh, different things, new things, you know, for my life. This is what I always did. And, and you, you did come back from that in 2005 and... Uh, my next question was, how did you keep the faith? But you, you obviously did that by taking your mind off football. Um, but you came back into the side 2005. I think performances started to improve um, for Arsenal. Uh, I wonder if there was a, a correlation between a side with Gilberto in it and a side without Gilberto in it. Do, do you feel um, they, they missed you during that time? I believe so. <laughs> yeah, I <think> so. <laughs> well, I know we, of course, we. Uh, I'm joke, but uh, well, I can say that the, the team was really good. But um, then when I came back, you know, I believe for for everyone is good to have everyone fit and available to play when it, it needs. And uh, I came back, you know, fully fit, and. Um, was a long way, you know, I stayed six months out of football and uh, three of them, I, I came back to Brazil uh, in 2004 and I spent three months here until the, the injury healed and um, start to do some rehabilitation here and then went back to, to England, you know, to finish everything at Arsenal. And um, I, now I was hungry to play football again. I was uh, sharp enough to to get to the team and do everything I could, you know, to help them. Because you know, in the past months I, I didn't see much about what was going on at us. I didn't know exactly, honestly, to to know about the results. I didn't find much information. I focused in my rehabilitation and, and my family. And, um, but when I came back, you know, it's like uh, a lion wants to, you know, to hunt. I was a lion, you know, uh, in the forest or somewhere I wants to, you know, to hunt. For me, hunt is, a, is, a, is play football in the best way I could, you know, get the ball back and pass to Cherry, to Dennis, to Lindbergh. Uh, what the players were whoever in front of me. This was what I had in mind at that time. Uh, and it seems to have worked. Um, 2005, you, you came back and you got a contract extension. Um, but then probably slightly surprisingly, uh, well, for us anyway, but maybe not for you, Vieira, Patrick Vieira left. Um, did you feel a kind of pressure to step up to fill, fill in his position and his captaincy? It was tough to, to see him, him go because uh, he was the main leader of, uh, of the players and um, it was quite tough, honestly. He, he was a very good partner, I guess, maybe the best partner I ever had in a football club and it uh, was, was hard. But then you have to understand this part of uh, football as well. He had maybe other things in mind. He maybe wants to change, new, wants a new challenge. And then you have to respect that. But for us, it was, was tough. You had to adapt without him. And how to, to do it is just uh, embrace the responsibility. Because if you don't embrace the responsibility, you understand that you are in a big club like Arsenal, that people rely on you and um, you just do things because you are there, but you don't do it in the right way you have to. And for me, it was about um, do the best I could to, to make um, my job and um, not fill the gap because it's very difficult to fill Patrick Vieira's gap. You know, it's quite impossible. But uh, to make things in a way that people respect what you do and they understand that you are doing your best and they are happy. They lost a good player, but they have another one to uh, keep the work moving forward. And it, it, again, it's this 
maturity and this attitude and this composure that you got your captaincy that season, but then you went on the next season when I think Dennis Bergkamp and Sol Campbell moved on, Thierry Henry was injured. And, I, you know, you took over the captaincy for Arsenal for basically the entire season, didn't you? I think that was 2006-07? Yes, exactly. How was what... it to pull on that captain's armband? <laughs> I was, um, at that time, Thierry was, uh, you know, um, the captain. But as you mentioned, Peter, he, he spends most of the season injury. And I, I took charge of it. Honestly, I really enjoyed. You know, was uh, I was big, I was very proud of being Arsenal captain because I knew, you know, uh, having before me Patrick Vieira, you know, a big inspiration for me, and then Thierry, another one, another guy, unbelievable, you know, uh, top guy, top player, and then I was there, you know, when the armband, you know, I was very proud, and um, but um. Uh, a different season for me as well because I took different responsibilities. I was a penalty taker on that time. That um, I think gave me the perception of the fans, maybe a different uh, uh, view from how they perceive me. Uh, because I, I was as a penalty taker, and then I scored a few goals and um, on that season, but took a different responsibility in front of the team as a captain, as a penalty taker, and uh, taking the responsibility that uh, we have missed, have lost some important players um, in the, la the season before. And then you have to, to bring everyone together at the same page to achieve the results we, we expect. You finished fourth that season, and you say you scored a few penalties. You scored 10 it's a fantastic record. Um, so when you went into the 2007-8 season, then you must have felt nailed on that you were captain. You know, everything was there because Henri had left at that point. So how did you feel when Arsene then decided to make, I think it was William Gallas captain at that time, wasn't it? Yeah, for me it was a big surprise, honestly. A big surprise, a little bit disappointed. And uh, but more disappointing for me was not exactly being the captain. It was about not being playing because I came back up after the Copa America and um, I did not manage to play the whole season. Lamini and uh, uh, Cesc Fabregas was uh, was the players, you know, the, from the start eleven. I didn't have many many opportunities to play because for me it was totally different because in the previous season when Always, I went. I've been to the national team. I came back for the preseason, normally late, and after three or four games, I was back in the team. And this time, did not happen. It was for me a bit strange, you know. Me and Austin had a few conversations regarding this, this this situation. He gave me his, his explanation. I respect him, but obviously frustrated and uh, disappointed. Disappointed of not being played regularly as uh, I did in the past five years. But um, then you have to to find a way to work out, you know, um, your frustrations. You know, um, I was frustrated, you know, for about I don't know two months. I was not happy going to the club for training session and. Um, until the day I decide, I, I said to myself, well, what's the point? You know, you are there. Just enjoy. Just enjoy the moment and uh, be ready because when they need you and you are going to be ready and you are going to be there to, to help the club because everyone uh, will expect this from you. And um, it's about your attitude, how you absorb the frustration, how you learn from them and uh, transform this as a, a step forward to overcome the, the, the problems. Because if I just look to the problem, I'm not playing why he's putting him, you know, I would, you know, I would end up, you know, every day 
uh, in a very bad mood. This is not what I want for me. Uh, not, it's not what I want, you know, to to people around me, either in the club, either at home. And you did play more games that next season. You you stuck with it, and I think it was thirty six twelve in the league. Um, and you also that season were put into another tier bracket. All, all you do is break records. Um, in 2007, you were put in the same bracket as Paul Scholes, Frank Lampard, as one of the only English midfielders to attain elite Champions League level, which is just another phenomenal, phenomenal stat. But that was just as your time at Arsenal was coming, in, coming to the end. And in July 2008, you moved on to Panathinaikos. Yeah, yeah. How was it closing with Arsenal? Well, it was, uh, honestly, it was really hard to leave Arsenal. Um, I remember I, there was a, possi a possible opportunity to stay in England before I moved to, to Greece. And, um, but uh, in the end, I decided to move for another country. I didn't know exactly how I was going to be to face Arsenal, play for another English English club. I was not gonna feel comfortable, honestly, to be honest. You know, and uh, then I decided to go to Panathinaikos, and uh, I think I was very happy there as well with my family. I kept enjoying football, was of course not the same level of England, but um, sometimes. Some uh, change you make in life is a uh, new, um, new step on your life for you to learn new things. And uh, I was happy there. I really enjoyed my time at Panathin as a player. My family really enjoyed living in a different country. And uh, I kept going to the national team this was something I was concerned if I stay at Arsenal in my last year. Maybe if I would be patient, maybe I would have played because I, I left the club. Flamini left. <laughs> it was not there. Maybe if I was a little bit patient. But as this is life, um, you have to, to live with, with your decisions. And I was sure about my decision. Of course, you know, um, Arsenal never left my heart, but leaving the club was a decision I had to make for my career because I still want to, to play another World Cup. And um, when you have to, this kind of decision, you have to, to embrace everything that's come to you afterwards. And you played for Panathinaikos and your final home game was for, in Panathinaikos on the 23rd of May and you scored the winning goal in a 1-0 victory for the Greek UEFA Champions League playoffs. And I think you won the league and the cup that season as well. What a season. And maybe you went and, I know you didn't mean to, but maybe you went and proved Arsenal wrong for letting you go. Maybe they regret of letting me go. <laughs> because... Um... Uh, yeah, but it's part of football, you know, sometimes you, you have an idea, um, for example, as a club, you make some decisions, maybe sometimes sometime work, sometimes may not, and, um, but uh, going to Greece, um, I was very happy, everything that happened to me there, I fortunated enough to, to live almost 20 years in my life in playing football with the clubs I have played, not many clubs. This is great, you know, only five clubs. And uh, in every club I've played, there is a, a beautiful story behind it. And um, full of um, friendship, hard work, and uh, passion uh, for what I did all the time wearing and respect the colors of uh, the shirts respecting the culture of uh, every club, fans, and uh, embrace every idea to, in order to, to give my best, to fulfill their expectation and to, to achieve 
what they expect from me and to give something more than what they expect. This is what I, what, uh, I always look for in everything I do in life. You know, this is what I, I try to do most of the time. And, and then after Panathinaikos, uh, you moved to an uh, apology, if I pronounce the name wrong, Grimimio, Grimirio. Uh, which is getting closer <laughs> to home. Got, I got there in the end. <laughs> um, uh, so, and you're 35 years old by this point. Um, were you starting to feel that, that it was coming to the end of your career and uh, you, you were perhaps looking for something different than um, big clubs and, and big contracts? Yeah, yeah you have to be, to, to have to realize that, you know, the time is coming to an end. It's quite sad for a, for a a football player when you see this but uh, return to Brazil to Grêmio was great um, this is the only club I never won a trophy there this intrigued me make me why not but um, there are some things you achieve more sometimes more important than trophies you you have in your career and uh, the friends I've made there and uh, the good thing is when I speak to people from Grêmio, from Porto Alegre, the fans, how much they miss me, you know, when they, 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 they say to me, oh, you left the club too early. You should have stayed another season. Uh, you have done great for the club. You know, we respect you for that. This makes me very proud because uh, football or sports is not only about trophies. It's about the respect you give to the game, the respect you give to people, to the club you are, the fans, uh, the people who work in the environment and the, and the example you give outside the sports, you know, for, for the people to respect you. Because they can be my, I can be their idol, but uh, at some point, but if it, I don't do things, they respect me, you know, all this fantasy as an idol disappear. And uh, but when people tell me we love you because we respect you for everything you did for for the club, this is um, what makes me very proud. And I think uh, there's some real evidence to back up your words here. Um, I've got a quote where you said, "Your dream is, and I think I'm right in saying you fulfilled this dream, to live on a small farm and ride a horse and have all of my family next to me." Um, and and that was actually something that you ended up doing when I think you returned uh, back to your original club, was it Atletico? Um, and what's the story behind that? How did, the, how did you achieve the dream? Well, uh, I'm still, I, I believe after I stopped playing football and I, especially in the past six months, I'm leaving this. <laughs> almost <laughs> dream of leaving the farm. Um, but um, back in Atletico Mineiro in 2013, after one and a half in, at Grêmio, was like uh, an opportunity to play the Copa Libertadores for Atletico Mineiro. I played at the Copa Libertadores, I think, back in 2000. For them, we didn't do well in the competition. And um, then was after all these years, I came back to the club in a very special moment. And um, I was very happy at the Grêmio. And when I got the invitation to go back to the club, I was, I was not sure because I was a captain of Grêmio. I had an opportunity to sign a new deal. And uh, the invitation came and I, I spoke to my wife, you know, regarding the situation. She said to me, oh, it's about you. Whatever you decide, I'm happy with. I said to her, okay. The, I have to take the decision, but let's go go back to Atletico because we are going to win the Copa Libertadores. And I said to her, this day and after we we went to Atletico Mineiro, and then a uh, beautiful history uh, happened in the club. We made a history of uh, winning this competition, the, the, the main competition of the history of the club. And being part of it was something very special for me because uh, win the ma this major trophy like uh, Champions League in, in Europe, here in South America, when you win the Copa Libertadores. 
and be part of this team, this squad, and be part of the history of the club, of uh, the most important trophy, is, uh, is something very special, very unique. You know, in, let's say my home, basically. And uh, now, as I mentioned to you, you know, after stop football, especially in the last six months, I've been having an opportunity to be in the farm a little bit. Not hide too much the horse, but the horse is still there. <laughs> yeah, sometimes feeding the chickens and uh, play around with my, not kids anymore, my, my, my kids, they grew up, but uh, with their friends and uh, relatives and the dogs and my wife and friends. I think this is, um, uh, this is, uh, well, looking back of everything, you know, it's, uh, it's a gift, the gift in, of life, a gift of uh, God for your life. Gilberto, I have to say this, you are one of the most humble, down-to-earth men I've ever had the privilege of speaking to. And your, your life has gone full circle and it's absolutely beautiful. And we thank you for sharing the story with us. What is next for Gilberto? Keep it being happy and simple. I think your life for me, I describe, I describe it uh, um, on a very simple journey when you had to do what you had to do, live your life with the people you love as I'm having this opportunity now of spending time with my, my wife and my, my kids, my parents. Thanks God they're still alive. And my, my sisters, uh, relatives, friends, friends of my friends now, of my, my kids. And uh, they bring them to my house and spend time together, have some time, some fun together. Then this uh, is about uh, enjoying it, uh, this part of life that I really miss. Uh, when I was playing football, but I had to, you know, to miss this because of football, this part of uh, the journey. And um, I, I still, you know, working hard on my way now because um, I have my own business. I have a hotel in my hometown uh, with the restaurants in the top. You are invited to come along someday. Love to. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And um, I have some other business in construction and uh, I still work in football. You know, I have my sports agency looking after some uh, talented athletes. You know, um, in England, I work with Fred from Manchester United and some other young talents um, here in Brazil. But you know, it's, you live football, but football is part of my, my blood, my soul. And uh, as long as I live, uh, I will be part of my life. Of course, you play the game on a different way. And now helping these, uh, these kids um, growing up in sports and helping them, um, let's say, uh, deal with their, their frustration and guide them uh, to achieve their dreams. This is, uh, is my aim you know, in sports right now. Well, Gilberto, we wish you luck with everything that you're doing. And I promise you that if me and Paddy ever make it to Brazil, we're coming for steak. <laughs> a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gilberto, man. thank you for joining us on the soccer sofa. And we look forward to chatting again with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pad. All the best. It was a pleasure to be part of the show. Talk to you guys. All the best. <laughs>